Hello, my name is Danielle Park, and this is Not So Common Sense for the week of February the 1st. When Maya Burhan Purkar was 10 years old, she was on a family trip to India when she volunteered in a local hospital just as the H1N1 virus was breaking out. She noticed firsthand that the drugs being administered to treat the illness had unwelcome side effects that included killing off healthy bacteria as well as the harmful. She began thinking about how antibiotics and antiviral medicines could be improved. On her return to Canada, Maya approached some nearby universities asking for lab time. When they all turned her down based on her youth, she borrowed some equipment from a local high school and set up a microbiotic lab in her home basement. Over the next few years, she developed a prototype for the first intelligent antibiotic that could differentiate and only target harmful bacteria. The next summer, her grandfather passed away from complications related to Alzheimer's, and Maya turned her attention to experimenting with agents that could breach the blood-brain barrier and inhibit plaque formation in the brains associated with Alzheimer's. In the process, she discovered new drug properties that could be used for cardioprotective treatments for seniors and athletes, which won her the distinction of the Grand Platinum Award at the National Science Fair that year, as well as the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. From there, she took an online calculus course just for fun, which prompted her to help answer a fundamental question of physics on the integral of distance and led her to more international recognition and awards, as well as an invitation to join an international team of students and researchers traveling to the Arctic to study the effects of climate change in the summer of 2013. Since she was going up north, Maya decided to take film footage, capturing the impacts that climate change was having on the lives and culture of humans living in the Arctic, which is now being produced as a documentary. Recently, she's launched a new technology called LIFE, designed as a low-cost mobile video conferencing system to help healthcare professionals volunteer virtual expertise along the lines of Doctors Without Borders but without having to leave home. I'm in, delighted to have Maya in our studios today. Welcome, Maya. Thank you. So I'd like to start with uh, a very basic question. How does a 10-year-old know how to set up a lab, number one, in their basement? And number two, how did you know how to begin the work of trying to create a new antibiotic? I didn't. Um, it, it was a three-year process for me to go from um, knowing absolutely nothing about antibiotics or um, how to set up a lab to being able to develop an intelligent antibiotic. And the, the main component was research. I spent hours looking through books, uh, looking online, asking people who I knew, science teachers, about how I could possibly set up this lab in my basement. Um, and it certainly isn't anything like uh, a university lab you might go to. Um, but it has its has same functionality. You can do all the same things in it. Um, but yeah, just research um, and reading about different protocols, different methods, what sort of tools you need. Um, just lots of reading. So your your education in science up to the age of ten, where did that come from? What what had you you know have you been in the basic public school system? You know what sort of uh, was it the regular textbooks that everyone else was reading? Uh, well, I had been in the basic public school system, um, but ever since I was young, I had always taken this really strong interest in science. Um, I would always prefer to watch BBC documentaries or Bill Nye the Science Guy videos instead of uh, Disney princess movies. And um, as I grew up, I would keep on watching these documentaries, keep on reading these different nonfiction books from the libraries, and I just gained knowledge from so many different fields of science by doing this. And your parents, did they have a science background or anything that you sort of were able to build on? My parents are both engineers, um, but that was, of course, 30 years ago that they, they had done that studying. And, and since then, they had done some entrepreneurial things, um, but they didn't really stay very heavily involved in the sciences after university. Um, and, and because of that, they had that scientific background, and they were able to help me and sort of encourage me um, but giving me specific, you know, information or material they weren't able to do. But they were always very, very supportive and very, very encouraging. Well, to let you build a lab in the basement, for one thing. Absolutely. Um, so 
how how do you find um, how has been your experience in the public school system then were they able to sort of direct you or support you in your kind of unique interest or your advanced uh, understanding in these areas how has it been for you um well well in in public school I guess the my teachers don't really get too involved in my projects it's more like a after school on weekends sort of thing that I do myself. Um, but I certainly did learn a lot from public school, um, skills in other areas and things like that. So you were uh, earmarked towards the gifted program by, was it grade seven that you started into that um, at, your, at your school? And was that, um, I'm just thinking, how boring was it for you to be in mainstream uh, class when you were reading all this material, as you say, at such an advanced level in your spare time? I guess um, the content itself might not have been that interesting, but I certainly learned a lot that you can't learn from a textbook. You learn, um, you know, how to in interact with people, social skills, things like that. You can't get from reading a book, and you can't get that from watching a documentary, right? So school was certainly always very interesting. It was always great to talk to friends, to play in the schoolyard. Um, so even though I had that scientific background, there were still lots to learn from school. So one of the things that strikes me, um, I'm in the field of finance, there's not that many women who do what I do, but when I'm looking at what you're uh, delving into at such a young age, there's even less uh, female representation. Um, certainly in the, in the education arm, there's probably a decent number, but in the practitioner, in the scientist uh, realm, there's still such an underrepresentation of women. What do you think? Uh, what 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 about you made you uh, interested in science when so many other people are not? Do you think we're expecting the right things from girls? Has there is is it anything to do with our expectation of what they should be interested in, or do you think it's all just innate in the individual? Well, for me, I guess it was just always there that interest in science. But I, I guess um, you know, girls' toys are always geared towards. Um, looking pretty and pretty things like princesses and Barbies, right? And I guess that's not too encouraging of, of science, whereas yeah, when you look at boys' toys, it's more like trucks and building things, and that's a lot more, um, involves a lot more critical thinking and analysis, and so that's a pretty big difference. Um, but I do think that's changing over time, and, you know, in the last few years, I think we've seen, um, you know, a fair amount of women entering um, fields related to STEM, and that's something that I really hope will, will keep on happening and increase. And when you say STEM, that stands for? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So uh, another question, um, you know, I always think of how many countries in the world are not even still allowing girls to have just a basic education. Um, and that we've seen some of the, you know, some very brave souls in other places who've taken a stand, for example, against the Taliban in places like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But what sort of, uh, what sort of hope or encouragement do you hope that you might offer um, as a role model to, to young people? Well, I, I certainly don't think that, um, that I've, I've faced as many struggles as some people um, in other parts of the world have. And um, I guess I just hope that, that um, other girls can see that it is possible, even if you're not um, working in a university and even if adults won't take you seriously, it is possible to make a change, and make meaningful change. It doesn't have to be in an area like science. It can be anything else, too. Um, but, but it is possible if you're young, if you're a girl, to, to have an impact on the world. So as you look at yourself and what you've accomplished so far, which is pretty impressive by most standards, what do you think has been your greatest attribute that's enabled you to do what you've done? Do you think it's just that you were born smart, or do you think that there's more, more behind it? I, I don't know if I was born smart. Um, you know, research in that topic is very interesting. Um, but I, I think that... Uh, a really important quality to have is always determination. Um, because regardless of what you want to do, there's almost always going to be people who, who don't want you to see, or see, succeed or people who want to put you down or people um, who are just going to be negative. And you have to, um, instead of seeing obstacles as barriers, see obstacles as challenges and things that can be worked around. Uh, and I think that's really important. 
Do you have anyone that you really look up to, or is there anyone in the world you think, wow, I'm so dumb compared to that person? Sure, lots of people, lots of people. Um, I mean, basically every single published scientist, right? Um, and, and I do, I look up to a lot of people um, in terms of qualities, maybe not the whole person, but, but yes, qualities. Um, people like um, Einstein or, or Gandhi or Feynman, certain qualities of these people are extraordinary. So you seem to be also very well read, not just in the sciences area, but you're aware of humanities and history. Have you studied much and do you read, you know, in a bunch of other fields? Um, have you studied, you know, uh, arts? Uh, what, how wide is your sort of uh, intake at this point? Well, I try to be, um, I try to read a lot um, in, in a variety of different fields. I find that I'm just interested in almost anything. And, you know, my parents always get really frustrated, like, why don't you just focus on one thing? But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm i interested in fields from arts to geography to science, everything. Um, I really enjoy playing the piano. That's um, one of my side interests, aside from science. Um, and, you know, I love to read about history and geography and, uh, global issues, things like that. So I guess you don't have a lot of time to sit around the house bored. <laughs> no, no. So if you were to uh, watch any kind of junk or read any kind of junk, I think one of the things parents today are concerned about is that there's a lot of stuff on the internet. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube. Uh, some of it exceptionally good and some of it, you know, horrifying, frankly, to me as a parent, like the reality TV obsession, and mm -hmm. uh, I see it as eating junk food, frankly. I, I think, you know, if you garbage in, garbage out is sort of my impression. But is there anything like that that you find time to consume as a teenager, or is it is it all kind of boring for you? Sure, Netflix is my friend. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, of course, like almost any other person, I love to watch movies or television shows, and not necessarily related to science in any way. So like Honey Boo Boo and those guys, are they interesting to you? Um, I don't really like reality TV too much. Um, I find that it really exploits negatives in people. And that's not something that I enjoy watching. In other words, it makes people maybe feel superior to a low bar. Is mm -hmm. that, that's how I sometimes think of it. Um, yeah. So do you, think, do you think we expect enough of teenagers? I know there's a lot of stuff written about on, you know, the pressures of being a teenager and you know, the, the peer pressure and, uh, at school and whatnot. But sometimes I'm worried that we don't perhaps expect enough in terms of what they're capable of. And, and it's sort of like if you don't set the bar high in terms of what people are capable of, they maybe think, you know, oh, I'm just a kid. Right. I, I think that really varies from person to person because from my experiences with doing things like science fairs and um, other science competitions, I see all over the world these incredibly hardworking, high-achieving students who are doing way more than I am, right? And I certainly think that, that they're, they're working at their maximum capacity. But I think there are other students as well um, who just need to be challenged a little bit. And I guess in our education system, we sort of set out this, this bar that's the same for every single student. And I don't think that really works too well because everyone needs to be challenged to a certain degree. Some people more than others, some people less than others. And I think that um, we can really, that, that, that students will be able to do a lot more if we just challenge them and push them a bit further and a bit harder than we are now. And as far as socializing with kids your age, and other girls your age, is it quite easy? Is it, it, have you found some people that, are, that you click with really well, or is it a bit ostracizing to be a, a girl like yourself? Oh, no, not at all. I have lots of friends in, in high school. So you're able to find lots of other things in common besides. I'm guessing they're not probably thinking about a lot of the stuff that you're kind of puzzling on on a daily basis. No, but it's fun to talk about other things sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think. I just, I, when, I was, when I finished writing my exam today, I was waiting for about half an hour at the school, and I was talking to my friends about everything from how my exam went to sports to, you know, other students. So. Who's a couple of your favorite musicians or music? What music do you love? I really like the piano a lot. Um, I mean, I like popular bands these days, too, but I guess um, my favorite is always Chopin. Ah, so not Lady Gaga. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your work. Um, the sojourn you made to the Arctic Circle last summer must have been pretty fascinating. It was amazing. You took the film footage yourself of people in the area. Did mm -hmm. you take a video camera with you? And, yep. and did you have to ask question and film? Was it easy or did you use a tripod? How did you do that? Um, it was not easy, <laughs> um, but it was a lot of fun. And um, I'm not in most of the videos uh, because I was taking the video at the same time. So I was asking the question behind the camera and the person I was interviewing was responding in front of me. And so where are you at with that project now, the, the production of that document? Well, I've gotten all of most of the footage done at least, and uh, so now it's just that process of putting everything together, editing it, making it all flow well, and that's basically where I've been at for the last little while. And it's I've never done anything like this before, so it's really there's been a lot of challenges and um, more obstacles to overcome. So, uh, but I'm hoping to get it done soon. Do you have any technical advisors or help um, in, in the whole how to put it all together? Not really, and that's something that I'm that I'm looking for. Back on the internet, scouring for <laughs> advice and ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I, you probably I don't know if you do remember the world before the internet. You don't, I don't think, right? Not really. No. So I mean, can you imagine doing what you're doing and learning as you go and figuring these things out if you didn't have the resource of the internet? Well, I do think about it sometimes. Like, I'll be doing a science assignment, and then I won't be able to find the answer in my textbook. So I'll just go online, look it up, and bam, it's right there. And, and I think about it, and I think that, wow, my parents had to go through you know, books, and they'd have to go to the library, and it would be such a tedious process just to find a tiny piece of information that, that students today can easily just go online and look up within seconds. So when you look at the issue of climate change, which I think is an enormous one today that's still not getting the attention that it really deserves. Do you feel, um, what do you hope to achieve with your documentary? And what further work would you like to do in that area, if any? Um, and are you generally pessimistic or optimistic about the pace at which the world seems to be addressing that issue? Definitely optimistic. Good for you. And um, the reason being, I really believe that the youth of today are have the power to to change what's going on right now. Um, ever since we were young, we've been educated about um, the dangers of climate change, the negatives of climate change, and I think that because of that, we will be more inspired and more motivated to do something about it. And is that what you're hoping with the documentary? What 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 is it? Because you're actually you took footage of the humans that live mm -hmm. up there, the indigenous people, and how it's impacting their mm -hmm. lives, which is a little bit different than the focus on the animal population and the mm -hmm. impacts it's having on them. And is it generally speaking all negative? The impacts that it's having on the people? Mostly, yes. I, I find that in school or in documentaries, you usually hear about the statistics behind climate change that. Um, sea levels are going to rise X amount, temperatures are going to rise Y amount, but I, even before traveling to the Arctic, I didn't realize that the people who actually live there are being impacted so severely by climate change. Um, you know, their, their traditional hunting practices, fishing practices, they're becoming obsolete because, um, you know, for example, with fishing, the ice sometimes, it, it doesn't, the, the, the water doesn't freeze over anymore. So they just can't go ice fishing anymore, and that's a huge loss of a food source for them. So yeah, there are a lot of people who are already being impacted by climate change, and I think if we don't do anything, it's, it's just going to get worse. So has it occurred to you um, to drop out of the mainstream high school process at all and sort of jump start into university studies? I mean, I've seen some brilliant kids in the past have chosen that kind of path. Has, there, have, has that crossed your mind? It's funny, actually, one of the people who I worked with um, last year, he had done that. Um, and I think he went to university when he was 14. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Um, I guess I've thought about it, but I don't think I would gain too much um, because there are so many things that I don't know. Um, I know a lot about a very, very specific subjects in science. I know a lot about, um, for example, Alzheimer's disease or about antibiotics, right? But I don't know a lot about everything else, and I still think I have a lot to learn from high school, and so I would definitely stay in high school and wait to go to university. So let's talk about Alzheimer's for a minute. Your grandfather had it, and that was the inspiration for you to do some further um, study, I guess, in that area. My mom actually got it at a very young age, um, and so I can 
I can uh, relate to how devastating a disease it is. And it seems to be just so widespread. And I don't believe it's just the aging dem demographics that's making it so prevalent. I have this suspicion it may be environmental or something like that. What, so where, where are you at with what you've learned and, and sort of what do you uh, see as the future for that disease? You know, I'm not entirely sure, and I think maybe talking to an Alzheimer's expert might be a better idea than talking to me, because um, I actually just recently attended a research conference on Alzheimer's disease that was in Vancouver, and really, there are just so many different leads that we have that are pointing to so many different things, and um, it's really hard to say where things might go in the future. So you're not doing any more particular research in that area, or? Um, well, I hope to continue my research in that area, but um, I, I think I've really reached my limit of what I can do um, in my, my basement lab, and now I would have to go on to um, a proper um, university microbiology laboratory to continue. So all of this uh, public uh, you know, awards and international acclaim you've got for the work you've done, you still can't get access to a <laughs> university lab, is that right? Mm -hmm. So you were doing some work out of the University of Toronto or under um, some scientists there, is mm -hmm. that right? And yeah, yeah, that was on uh, the physics project that I did last year. And because that isn't a biology-related project, the rules about who can enter a laboratory are far less strict, so that worked out well. So is it a, is it a danger issue? You're not allowed in under 18? Or what is the actual rule set? I think it's insurance. That's the problem. So as you look at uh, your future, you intend to continue at high school till mm -hmm. grade 12, and then what, Maya? Where do you hope to go, or what do you plan to do after that? <laughs> uh, I guess I have two more years to decide, so I'm not entirely sure, but probably university. Uh, I don't even know what I want to study. I'm so interested in so many different fields that it'll be a hard choice. Again, you know, in some brilliant people that are ahead of their time, they get into university and they actually leave it and go do something on their own because they find it too mundane, I guess, to go mm -hmm. through the basic learning of undergraduate, for example, before graduate work. But do you see yourself at this point pursuing like PhD studies in some aspect of science? Oh, that's so far ahead, I don't know. I, uh, on, on that topic, my dad actually did that. I think, was it, it was third year that he finished his third year, and then he started a company in his fourth year. So, um, but you know, I'm not entirely sure. I guess it. I'll, I'll, I'll make that decision when I come to it. And so I'm gathering you don't know if you intend to have a family someday. Do you think it's possible to sure. have it all, <laughs> as they say, to to have this dynamic career with creative thoughts, invent companies and new technologies, and still be a mom and a wife and a and run a house and get the groceries, do you think that's all in your future? Oh, wow. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, you know. I guess I'd have to talk to other people who are doing that and see how it's going for them and then make a decision. So Maya, when you have tests coming up at school, do you really sweat them or do you, do you study a ton? Do you sort of lay back and say, how hard can this be? I know the material. Where do you sit in that spectrum? I study a ton, a ton, yeah. So are you, um, you'd consider yourself a perfectionist? I guess so. I, I like doing things properly. Yeah. So when you get, uh, what's a good mark in a course for you as far as you're concerned? A hundred percent? So if, 99%, you, if you miss, like you're, you had the highest average at your high school or something last year, didn't mm -hmm. I read that? And was it 98% or something like that? Yeah, I think it was 98.5 or something like that. Yeah. So one of the things that I find fascinating when I talk to people who have had long successful lives and, you know, there's an appearance sometimes that they've only had success, right? And people will say, oh, they're, they're good at everything. You know, what do they know about how hard it is for the rest of us mm -hmm. kind of plugging along? But I do think that there's a lot to be learned from our failures in life, our mistakes, mm -hmm. right? So what, what would you say, um, I mean, at this point, I think you've had mostly pretty good outcomes, mm -hmm. right? You haven't had a lot of experience with failure. What do you, what do you think about that? I guess um, in my case, I just wouldn't get